Dr. John Bennett for Neurosurgical TV televising from Miami Beach. There's just a few people on the beach. They're violating the curfew. But anyways, uh, we're going to shake it up today a little bit. Uh, I'm having trouble with uh, internet connections in Nepal. So what we're going to do is we're going to play a video of basal tip aneurysms that I did before. And then Khalif is, has volunteered nicely to uh, lead the discussion after that. So let me just try to arrange that effectively. And so, uh, and we'll introduce all the panelists after, but let's do this video first. We'll watch this. And then, uh, okay, he wants to, uh, minutes four to 12. He instructed me, so let me play uh, that. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay. Now tell me if you can hear it okay. Mm. This is as stubborn as I am, but I'm more stubborn. So uh, you see, that is the aneurysm. You can see that. And these are the two P1s. That, that is a basilar. There are two small superior cerebellar artery aneurysms. This is, I mean, so, superior cerebellar arteries. That is a PCOM. And this aneurysm is uh, pretty high and it's posteriorly projecting. So we, because it was high, we have wanted to get a projection from low to high. So we had to take off this long clinoid. You can see this clinoid is really long. So we took off this clinoid. We did a transcavernous approach and uh, you will see how it is done. Yeah, so we, uh, we have already uh, cut the orbitomeningeal band. Those who have uh, seen my lectures and uh, earlier would be familiar with how the orbitomeningeal band is cut. And then uh, you have the cavernous sinus there on that side. Here I am cutting uh, the dura. This is called the hybrid approach where if I'm not uh, familiar with where the carotid is, then I can just uh, cut and have a look as to where the carotid is. And also we are in the cisterns right now. You must understand we are right in the, in the base of the brain, what Bharti was showing. Extradurally, I can get into the systems there, so that helps in many ways. One is to, to get into the, um, to the systems as well as uh, see intradurally what is happening. So that is the last piece of clinoid being taken out there. And after you take out the clinoid, you have the optical, I mean, oculocarotid membrane, carotid oculomotor membrane, and then you can see that there. That is the carotid there. So now dural opening and you can see this is the optic now. So you're cutting the, the arachnoid and then now you have, that is a cavernous sinus there and that is a tent. That is where the third nerve is going into the cavernous sinus. That's the third nerve. Hey John, we can't see the video. Now I'm going okay, lateral to on. the carotid. That's okay, a PCOM. Yeah. And you can yeah, see I'm the sorry. clot. The I'm lucus sorry, membrane is you filled with see it. Okay, okay. I'm and sorry. So now see it. I am I'm opening sorry. The optocarotid membrane, sorry, just trying to develop this plane. Thanks for telling me. I don't think. Proximal ciliary intersection is also in the video. You see it okay? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you hear okay, yeah. Well. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Slowly expanding the corridor more and more. And now you can see the liliquous membrane uh, that is between the third nerve and the carotid. You can see the liliquous membrane is being developed now. Now I'm going between the opticocarotid membrane, opticocarotid window, and I'm developing uh, this plane. So cutting the liliquous membrane and uh, getting into the basilar uh, artery now. So that is the basilar. And now you can see clearly, I will show you the third now on the contralateral side. Anything above the third now is P1. So remember this dictum, this is the only truth in neurosurgery in posterior fossa surgery. You can see the white thing, that is the third nerve, and above the third nerve is P1. So if this is P1, the cat's a contralateral P1, that is a basilar, and there is aneurysm. So as we expected, posteriorly projecting aneurysm. So uh, that is aneurysm. It is going into the interpretacular fossa, that is P1. This is a superior cerebellar artery. This is the basilar artery. And you can see, now I'm dissecting between the P1 and the neck of the aneurysm. 
you must understand i don't have any proximal control here we don't uh, uh, we don't have space to put another clip and uh, you know it is it's a bit difficult it's a very small window very high aneurysm so we are uh, we are put we are dissecting between uh, the p1 and the the aneurysm so that i get some space so you have perforators here you have to be very careful uh, i mean if you if you if you are not kind to the perforators they will not be kind to you as well so you have to be very very uh, careful in dissecting this aneurysmal neck from the perforators so earlier i used to for the basilatic aneurysms i used to put in a small surgery cell and just push the surgery cell uh, forward uh, so that we can avoid the uh, perforators but these days i don't do this so i am now i have got a very good plane between uh, the aneurysm and the p1 and now i will i will go i will put the clip now so this is the p1 i have a very good plane i can see always there is a little bit of blind spot uh, if there are posterior perforators there are there is a bit of a blind spot uh, but I sometimes i dissect uh, uh, all the whole aneurysm uh, if it is a basilatic also uh, i can show you some of the videos where we have dissected the entire aneurysm free um, we have taken the blood clot out and seen the rupture point and all that it is much more safer than anti recirculation aneurysms to do this but uh, uh, sometimes you really don't require this uh, sadomasochistic procedures so you can directly put a clip and uh, uh, you can uh, you can straight away now i'm going to do this now yeah so the orientation of the clip as well as uh, uh, how you put the clip is very very important this window is very narrow you must understand so so you putting a clip there gently massaging the artery massaging the aneurysm and then putting so first clip not good so we are going in going in furthermore always err on the side of uh, uh err on the side of being more gentle not on the side of being more brash and more uh, rough so very very slow very very slow and just clip that's it so uh that is done now so we will see now the post op uh, i can hear you i can hear you please the patient is extubated it was done day before the the video patient is extubated is obeying commands right now i can fit a few there but the voice uh, voice is excellent uh, khalif can you hear the video so yeah you, i can hear very well okay the clip down your zoom it's your uh, audio uh, setting no advance is a not perfect is don't uh, sorry? think that they are perfect is arising from the aneurysm they are not it's now okay it's now okay that's it's now P1. okay that's one p1 that's the other p1 that's a basilar and uh, this is the same technique that uh, parthiban showed the uh, cystonostomy it is the same technique you dissect more arachnoid and you will be able to do it so instead of uh, training for a decompressive hemicraniectomy i think neurosurgeons as party told you, you as neurosurgeons you should start to do micro neurosurgery and only then only you will not think that this is very difficult and this is, you can see the superior cerebellar artery beautifully now and you can see the carotid the basilar p1 and you can see distal to p1 there is no aneurysm filling so you can see the superior cerebellar there p1 there you can see the basilar there you can see the contralateral p1 taking off there that is a basal acting we are just demonstrating it to fellows and uh, uh, our residents that that there is no aneurysm left now okay <coughs> everything okay and uh, okay we would like to we would like you to see the first up scan also it is okay, there okay khalif okay i we'll stop that there all right and and we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants I did have a good internet connection so Khalif a neurosurgeon yeah. from Kenya has agreed to take over okay Khalif it's all yours <laughs> yeah so we're not going to pretend that we we can interpret what professor Ip is doing i'm not qualified to do that uh basilar tips are very complex and i think it's the in terms of the 
the complexity of aneurysms, uh, basilar tip aneurysms and the uh, ophthalmic aneurysms are the most complex and they were the reasons why coiling was developed. So instead what I'm going to do is, uh, instead of giving commentary on how he was doing the procedure, what we're going to do is we're going to have a discussion on basic sciences of posterior fossa vascular system uh, in terms of uh, MCQs, multiple choice questions for people who will be preparing for exams like myself. Is that okay with everybody? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So any, any residents, fellows preparing for exams? In the group? Yes, me. Yeah. All right, Javier. So <laughs> there's no screen. Okay. Uh, in your presentation. Question I'm going to share. Okay. Yeah, we can yeah. see it, uh, Doc. You can see it, right? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Oh, did I share? Uh, no, no, I you, start, you started sharing. Okay, I need to mute okay. you, Dr. Heifers. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Let me share. Yes. All right, so. So, yeah. So that will be the first question. So you take uh, 30 seconds to figure out and then we'll proceed. Yes, it's the answer the is topic, B. By the way. Yes, the answer is B because it will be contralateral. It will be contralateral. Yes. All right. Any other suggestions? So we need to understand what is Wollenberg syndrome. It's also called the lateral medullary syndrome. It's usually caused by occlusion of the pica or vertebral artery. And this can happen from using the pica or uh, vertebral artery section. And what you get is uh, the lateral uh, wall of the medullary of the medulla gets uh, ischemic or impacted. So when you get infection, impaction in this area, it's, uh, you'll get an ipsilateral sensory loss on the face with contralateral sensory loss of the body. So lesions or lateral medullary syndrome spares the pyramidal tracts. Many people don't get the pyramidal tract symptoms. Okay. So this is what the clinical will look like. So you get an ipsilateral uh, sensory alteration of the face with contralateral uh, sensation loss on the body. Do you see the picture? Yes. All right, I think we, we got disconnected there for a short while. No, you're, you're connected, okay. <clears throat> Am I connected now? Yes. You're not screen sharing. I'm not screen sharing, all right. No, no. All right, so let me do that. Yeah, the internet I think is an issue. So do you see that picture now? Yes. Yeah, do you see that picture? Yes. Wallenberg syndrome. Yeah, so this is the Wallenberg Wallen, uh, syndrome. It's named after a German neurologist who described this. this. So you get a lesion or you get a lateral medullary ischemia or infarction and this is what the patient will present patient will present with uh, sensory loss of the face with contralateral sensory deficit of the body and this is how the patient will look like all right so this is the a picture of where the lesion will be so the shaded area is where the ischemia will be if you get a, a pica of that side occluded, okay? And you get all those, uh, all those nuclei affected, all right? 
So the general, these are the symptoms. You get a vertigo because you have uh, affection of the vestibular nuclei or its connections. You'll also get ipsilateral facial pain and prosthesia. And this is because of the descending tract of the fifth nerve nucleus. And then you get a Horner syndrome because of the descending sympathetic tract are affected. You get dysphagia or diminished gag, basically uh, symptoms of uh, ninth and 10th nerve deficit. You also get numbness of arm, trunk, and leg. And this is because of the cuneate and grisai nuclei, which are located in the lateral segment of the medulla. With the Wellenbach syndrome, we look something like. Can I see? Everyone see this? Yeah, your voice John, kind of you broke. Yeah, yeah, your voice kind of broke up. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Can you see what the, M the MRI? Yes. Yo, so that's what the the patient MRI will look like. A patient with uh, with uh, lateral medullary syndrome or Wellenbach syndrome. That's where the ischemia will be. Okay, so coming back to the question after the, the small uh, explanation, the answer is as Hafiz has said, the patient with the, with the Wellenbach syndrome will not have an increased, or a decreased pain and temperature of the body in the epsilateral side. Okay, it will be on the contralateral side. All right. Then the next one we're going to discuss is this one. Can everybody see this? Can yes. everybody see my slide? Yes. Yeah, so we also take a minute. Can everybody see it? Yes. All right. So. <clears throat> A patient with a basilar tip aneurysm surgery, the highest risk of perforating vessel injury occurs when the aneurysm is directed to which, which side? Anterior, posterior, cranially, to the right or to the left? Maybe posteriorly. Okay, and why do you say that, um, Harviz? Because the perforating vessels go posteriorly, usually, from the basilar and the B1s. So, oh. exactly. So the posterior arise from the P1. The P1 is the PCA segment before before it's joined by the PCOM. I'm going to show you some, some images. And these are the, the parameters that are supplied. Remember the anterior thalamoperator so in this segment, oh, I can't show it. In the P1, P1 now the perforators that supply the brain, the, the, the midbrain, the thalamus, they arise from there. So the picture. So this is the uh, whoop! It's hanging there. The Wi-Fi is getting crowded. <clears throat> Be patient. Hmm. Whoop, he fell off there. Sorry, sorry That's okay. about that. That's okay. You, yeah. fell, you fell off the lot on the screen I share there. Okay, you're back on. Yeah. So, yeah. Can you see this picture? Yes. 
Yeah, so the perforators are arising from the P1 and they supply the midbrain, the thalamus, and you see how, how they look like. So there's something called artery of Pacheron, which you also need to be aware when you're dealing with the basilar tip. Usually the, the supply is bilateral. So both P1s give perforators that supply the, the midbrain and the, the posterior thalamus. But in some anatomical anomalies, you'll find that the artery of Pacheron arises from one of the PCS instead of two. And in that case, it supplies both sides of the thalamus from one vessel. So if you're not aware and you uh, accidentally clip one of those buffers when you're doing the when you're doing the basal tip aneurysm, then the patient will definitely not wake up. So it's something just need to be aware of it. And for people who will be preparing for the exams, the MCQ can have uh, something like this. So these are the different ways the, the aneurysm of the basilar tip can point. It can point anteriorly, it can point superiorly, pointed upwards, and it can also point posteriorly. So I want you to see how it looks like when it's when it's pointing posteriorly, how many perforators are on top of the, of the aneurysm itself. So coming back to our questions. Coming back to our question, the basilar tip aneurysm is, the, the, the injury to the perforators is most likely when the aneurysm is pointed posteriorly and that's the answer. Everybody will agree with that? And thank you, Hafiz, for, for saying that. So this is the final one. Can everybody see it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So let's go through it. I'm going to show you an angiogram and then an MRI for a patient who's been worked up for chronic headache. And then the question will follow. So this is the angiogram. And this is from a, a previous uh, multiple choice question paper online. Okay. And this is the MRI of the same patient. And this is the question. The vessel indicated by the arrow is the fetal PCOM. Anterior choroidal artery. Fetal PCOM is posterior communicating artery. Persistent trigeminal artery. Normal posterior communicating artery or persistent aortic artery. So in this, the concept is to have uh, knowledge about the carotido basilar anastomosis, which, is, which happens in, in, in utero. And sometimes these vessels can persist instead of regressing, they can persist and cause uh, symptoms later. So this artery is what you need to identify. The MRI. Okay, and that's the question. Any, any guesses? Any... Pres Persistent trigeminal artery, I guess it is. All right, Dr. Maybe. Lewis suggesting is P ETA? Yes. Maybe resistant to attack artery because it's more proximal? Uh, half, half, yeah, half is saying it's persistent aortic artery. I want you to look at it again. That's the MRI. The brainstem level is a vessel coming from the anterior circulating system or the ICA, internal carotid artery, and it's pointing and coming towards the brainstem. And that's how it is. In, a, in an angiogram. And if you look at it, it's supplying a distal basilar. The PCS are arising from this vessel instead of the, of the uh, from the proximal or caudal basilar, basilar artery. Okay, any more guesses? All right. So more pictures of the same. Dr. Haviz, do you want to change your... Your answer? 
Yes, I think persistent trigeminal. Yep. Yeah, you're right. Yes. Yes. So that's the answer. It's a persistent trigeminal artery. Can you hear me, John? Hey, I'm welcome. Oh, hi. Hi. Yeah, Khalif is doing a super job taking over. Yeah, so okay. let me stop sharing. Okay, okay. Uh, do you guys do you want to take over, I or? So, Prof. Yeah, we're just you... doing some MCQs related to the topic. Okay. Did you yeah. see so, the basilar? We saw the, the video. Okay. Do you want me to discuss yes. it once more? I think so. And then okay. some of the questions related to it, please. Okay, so I will go ahead and uh, discuss that as well as uh, maybe another basilar. Let me just see if uh, I can discuss another basilar as well. So, uh, ruptured basilar. Okay, so I am going to share the screen. Okay. Am I sh are you seeing it? Not yet. Not yet. Uh huh. Okay, it's sharing now. It's sharing now? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, all right. Just wait. Uh, now I'm going to enlarge it. Okay. So now you can see this uh, basal tip? Yes. All right. So what you have to understand is this is the aneurysm. That is a P1. That's a P1. Now, if we had a lateral projection, we would have understood that this aneurysm is pointing posteriorly. So this is one of the most difficult basal tips to operate. I mean, uh, posteriorly pointing basal tip is uh, not really great. Uh, so this is why I wanted to show this. So let's go ahead. Now, how I'm going is I hardly go the subtemporal way. So I'm going to take all this uh, clinoid out and I'm going to, uh, after that, as usual, I will uh, do a, a axial unlocking so that the temporal lobe completely moves away out of my out of my vision i mean the temporal lobe moves away so what i'm doing is this is the temporal lobe i want it laterally moved and then i need when i move the temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus what i get is that an unobstructed view towards the towards the interpedangular system so and also i do this sagittal unlocking here obviously there is no aneurysm in paraclinoid so i can take off the clinoid as a one piece there's no problem okay only when the paraclinoid aneurysm is there i go and i had to go and very carefully drill it now you see that is the optic now okay that is the optic now and that is the carotid as usual, I dissect with a suction and a patty, and that is the third now. So you can see the PCOM there. Can you see? And that's a membrane of Liliquest. So you are clearing it off all the blood, and then you are dissecting between the optic and the carotid, keeping in mind that the ophthalmic can sometimes be there, using a diamond knife just to dissect the proximal sylvian to get more space. So you can see the carotid there and you can see the temporal lobe there. You can uh, see the clot. Now between the carotid and the third now, this is the carotid, that's the third now. So I'm between the carotid and the third now, I'm dissecting the vessel. Now I have gone back to the window between the optic and the carotid. So that is a PCOM. So all these windows are filled with blood. So you have to be very careful because the aneurysm is right there and you cannot go and be careless. So we are opening up, slowly we are opening up. Now we are finding the basilar 
anterior border of the basilar. Lot of arachnoid adhesions. So he's slowly taking out all the adhesions. You can see perforators there. Now the contralateral third now. You know, you see that is the point. You know, now if you will see, I am going to dissect on the. See that is the contralateral third. Can you see the white thing? Can you see the white thing? Yes. That is the most important thing. You know, I am going to show that to you again. Okay. I am going to dissect, 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 and I have to find. Okay, that white thing. If you see that white thing, that means anything above that white thing is PCA. Anything below that white thing is superior cerebellar, and that is a basilar. So this is the most important thing that see. That is a contralateral third nerve. So if the contralateral, that is a contralateral third nerve. This is the basilar top. There will be superior cerebellar here. That the basilar trunk should be here. Okay, so that is what orients you. Okay, so that is the basilar trunk. This is the superior cerebellar. These are the P ones. The aneurysm is probably somewhere here. So now this is my idea. Okay, now I'm dissecting. Yes. Now I'm dissecting. So that is a P one. That is a P one. It's a posterior direct aneurysm. I'm putting a patty and I'm dissecting above the aneurysm. Okay. Now that is an aneurysm. I know that that is an aneurysm. That is a P1. So I have to get space between the aneurysm and the P1. You see? So I have to dissect yes. this area. Are you understanding? Yes. Yes, yes. So I am slowly dissecting between the P1. You must understand that there is no temporary clip here. <laughs> so there is no control and it is, a un, it is not an unruptured aneurysm, it's a ruptured aneurysm. It can go off any time, you know. That is the thing which, which you are working. So here you have to be very, very careful, okay. You don't want unnecessary movement. So you are slowly dissecting between the, between the P1, this is the basilar, that's the P1, that's the aneurysm, okay. So you are dissecting between the aneurysm and the P1 trying to make some space so as long as you don't touch the uh, top of the aneurysm i mean the fundus of the aneurysm you're kind of safe you know the usually i mean i've had experience where the aneurysm is torn from the base uh, maybe i can show you some videos of that but usually it doesn't happen the aneurysm doesn't tear from the base so now i have got space you see i'm pulling up the perforators so, and I'm pulling up the perforators and now I've got space. Okay. There, my suction is showing that I've got space there. That is a space. Okay, that's enough for the clip. So, I'm looking for space on this side now and I think I've got space. Okay. So, you're going with the, with the clip. I cannot push it in. So, I'm just trying to contract this aneurysm it you know what by contracting what i do is i dissect when i'm contracting i dissect actually okay uh, when i clip partially i am actually dissecting the base so that you should not attempt to clip at one go you should do this motion slowly massage the aneurysm so that your clip is dissecting okay your clip is slowly dissecting and you can see what is beyond the clip are you understanding Yes. 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 So, um, so you you clip again. You see if it is okay. If it is not okay, now you can see the aneurysm completely white. No problems. Okay. So that is the P one. That is the basilar tip. That is an, an, another P one. The aneurysm is completely clipped. So that is P1, P1, superior cerebellar that side. Okay. You inspect everything. That is a superior cerebellar on this side. And you can see that is this is the carotid, that is a PCOM, and that is a basilar, and the P1, P1, and the aneurysm is clipped off. Okay. All right. Right. I have a so question. I have a question. Go ahead. Oh, 
Yes, what will be the complication? Beg your pardon? What will be the complication of the procedure? What will be the complication of the procedure? I didn't understand. Yes. Yes, exactly. You mean to say what can be the complications of the procedure, isn't it? Yes, yes. Because this patient had no complications. He, he comes walking to my office all the time. But when you do this thing, then you can have a premature rupture. I can show you. Maybe I can show you a premature rupture. Uh, okay. If there is a premature uh, rupture, you have to go under cardiac arrest. I didn't understand that. I didn't, I didn't get you. Maybe Malak, you're my. Malak! Who's this? Please, could you mute people? I mean, like. Yeah, everyone not speaking. Please mute. Please. I, I, I hear some children. <laughs> everyone is muted, but I hear some kids. And I will tell you, I think the album, it's the album. I think I'm going to do it. Okay, sorry about that. I, uh... okay. okay, yeah, so um, somebody was asking about the complications. So you can hear me now? Yes. Yeah, so the thing is, the premature rupture is a problem. So uh, we've had this situation sometime, but uh, you know, we use adenosine, so uh, we go under cardiac arrest and then we clip it. I mean, uh, this is not a big complication, especially in patients with heart problems and all using adenosine, the anesthetist may be a bit worried about it. But otherwise, uh, not really much of a complication. Well, I've had some experiences where I clicked off some of the perforators in Basilar and then the patient never woke up. So this can happen. Uh, sometimes the clipping is very beautiful, but if you haven't seen the perforators on the pre-op scan, and sometimes it can happen that you clipped off the perforators and then you can have a problem. Uh, these are the two major complications. Once I've had a... Uh, once when I was, I mean, there was a patient lady with a connective tissue disorder. And then once we were clipping the basilar, what happened is the ICA tore. And then we had a lot of problems. We had to repair the ICA with clips and then the basilar also ruptured. So then we had to go under cardiac arrest and go and uh, clip that basilar. I may have the video somewhere. I can show you that also. Would you like to see another? When we decide to go for surgery, for basilar tip, when we decide that basilar tip, uh, surgical or for coiling or uh, other basilar procedures, maybe. Okay, we don't do coiling at all. We clip every aneurysm because uh, in my center, uh, patients mostly don't afford uh, coiling. So, I mean, um, we, I don't like coiling. I am not a big proponent of coiling. And of course, basilars, uh, they say it is easy. I don't know about it, but I know. I mean, I know clipping is not very difficult. So I go by clipping. Sir, what clip do you prefer to insert for the basilar trip? And sir, so is, there, is there any scope of the tandem clipping technique in, the, in such kind of aneurysm, especially with wide neck? I didn't understand your question at all. Uh, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Once, once again, Noor, slowly, please. Uh, slowly. Sir, uh, uh, what clip do you prefer for basilar chip aneurysm? Like uh, a straight or a fenestrated one? Like, uh, say, there are perforators there. So many people say that they use perfor perforating type of uh, clip. And sir, the other question is, do you, what will be the scope of tangent clipping for a basilar tip aneurysm with a wide neck. Okay. 
Yeah, so first of all, I, I don't have much of a, uh, you know, preference for any clips. Whatever clip they give it to me, I use it. I usually generally use a straight clip. I can get away with it. Uh, sometimes you need a fenestrated clip, is if the aneurysm is very big, then you want to first clip it with a fenestrated clip and then clip again with it because the posterior part of the aneurysm has to be taken care of first. And then you clip on top of it, with, you clip it with a straight normal clip. So that is if the aneurysm is really big. In that case, I generally go for a cardiac arrest and I, um, I clip maybe midway and then I rupture the aneurysm. This, this will help you to uh, you know, collapse the aneurysm and then you can uh, clip it. I don't, I'm not a big proponent of putting so many clips uh, or putting a proximal clip on the basilar. But having said that, there are some aneurysms which are very, very difficult to clip. What is going on? I mean, even if you have a very good understanding of the pre-op scan, at my stage, uh, sometimes left clip aneurysms, uh, when they are extremely big, you really don't understand where the perforators are going to. So, um, second question is tandem clipping. Well, sometimes, yes. So I use the, if I'm using tandem clipping, I use it like a temporary clip, which means I the aneurysm and then dissect the, after I clip the aneurysm, it may be an incomplete clipping, but then I can dissect. After I dissect the aneurysm, Thank you so much, sir. I got the, got, the, got the answer very right. Thank you so much for the very nice explanation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. I uh, just wanted to, we were discussing some questions related to the topic. Do you want to? Hi. Do you want me to show another, another MCA as well? Sure. Or... Okay. All right. All right. Uh, Dr. Gilbert, could you please mute? Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, Maliza, can I your dashboard? Share. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, uh, it's Chris from South Africa. How are you? Hey, Chris. Good to see you, man. <laughs> good, good. C can you just touch on your decision making for a basilar tip if you're going to approach from the right side, the left side, and what anatomical details um, you use to decide what's the, the best side? Yeah, so if the aneurysm, see, um, generally I go from the right side. I mean, unless you. I mean, you really don't want to go from the left side because uh, unless you're left-handed, I'm actually lefty. So uh, even then, I, I prefer to go from the right side. It's always easier. But if the aneurysm is leaning towards the left side, leaning towards the left side, and you think you're not going to be able to get between the aneurysm and the left P1 without a lot of retraction, then... You, I mean, the, you know, the optic apparatus comes in between you and uh, the P1 and the neck. So unless you're going to be, you know, if the aneurysm is leaning towards the left side, I don't go from the left side. If the aneurysm is leaning, this aneurysm was leaning towards the right side. Did you notice that? I had to dissect yes. between, yeah, I had to dissect between the aneurysm and the right P1. So this was... Although it was going posteriorly, it was much easier, easy for me. But if this aneurysm was posterior and left, and I had to dissect it between the left P1 and uh, uh, the aneurysm, this would have been a bit difficult for me. Uh, because, I mean, my dissection would not be under proper, proper vision. So in this case, sometimes I go from the left side. Left side. But if you 
get all the windows open. That is the main thing, you know. If you get all the windows, you need to do your androlateral unlocking. Do you need to do your clinoidectomy? You need to make sure that the temporal base is completely drilled off so that the temporal uh, lobe can completely go out uh, of your way. Then you need to make sure that your sylvian is really, really opened up. You need to open your opticocarotid window. You need to open your lateral carotid window. After all this, okay, generally this is not a problem. This, I mean, whatever direction you're going from, left, right or center, it shouldn't be a problem. So people make uh, mistakes by hurrying into the aneurysm. You should not. I mean, my advice would be don't focus on the aneurysm. Just focus on arachnoid dissection. As much as arachnoid dissection that you can do, just focus on all the skull base work. No, it doesn't have to be really big. You can do a clinoidectomy. You can do, you know, uh, cavernous, transcavernous dissection or pericavernous dissection as I do it. And after that, you open the dura and then start going ahead and... Uh, uh, opening all the arachnoid, sylvian arachnoid, opticocarotid, I mean, lateral carotid, everything you open up, open up the third nerve all the way, uh, open the arachnoid of the third nerve all the way up to uh, the brainstem. And after this, uh, these aneurysms are going to be rather very easy. So that would be my advice, Chris. Thanks, I appreciate it, yeah, so I am going to show you, uh, and I mean, this I'll have to share from the YouTube, I think. So um, I'm going to first put, put the YouTube on. Oh, you, you can already see, right? I'm, I'm already sharing it, right? Yeah, you, 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 you own the screen right now. Okay, right. Well, if I do YouTube here, I'm going to go up Zoom or something? No, no, just go right to YouTube. You, you, can, you can take uh, us wherever you want, really. Yeah, that's good because I can show you some. Uh, okay, let me search for this guy. Hi. Hi. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, Goi. Good to Hi, see you, bro. brother. Yeah, good to see you. And uh, after you finish your uh, sharing, and uh, can I share two uh, basilar tip arteries? Yes, yes. Uh, uh... That'd be great. Of course, of course, of course. So we'll have a lot of basilars today. <laughs> yeah, once you you're on this. this yeah, yes, we can see it. It's loading. Yep. Okay. Right. So this is a reason the MCA aneurysm is not very, very difficult or anything, but just wanted to show you. So this, this is the dural opening. This brain was a bit angry. So we have to uh, get into the systems. They're getting into the cisterns. Very thick arachnoid. So cutting that arachnoid, proximal sylvian. This is a blood clot. That's a blood clot. So gently cutting all that arachnoid. Separating the arachnoid from the carotid. So you can see the carotid right now. You can see the optic now. Can you see clearly, guys? Yes. Okay. So again, uh, no retraction in the beginning, just uh, patty and a suction. You can see the posterior clinoid process, posterior clinoid process there. So that is the carotid there. And you can see the ophthalmic artery. You can see the ophthalmic artery there. That's the optic now. That's the ophthalmic artery coming. This is a lat quite laterally placed ophthalmic artery, see? That's ophthalmic artery coming there and going underneath. So that is the posterior clinoid process. 
So you're cutting the arachnoid leading to the membrane of Liliquest. If it was a basilar, I would have clipped, the, I would have drilled this off. Uh, there is no need for an MCA to do that. I mean, so you are seeing the PCOM and the anterior choroidal on this side. You can see that is a third nerve. That's a third nerve. So all that dissection that I told you, I'm going to do it even for an MC aneurysm. You will, you will ask me why, you will understand why. So that is a third nerve. I'm going to open the arachnoid sleeve of the third nerve. You can see what I'm doing? Everybody? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. All right. So I am cutting the root sleeve, I mean arachnoid sleeve of the third nerve. So that this temporal lobe can be mobilized further easily. Okay. This temporal lobe is stuck to the third nerve by this arachnoid. So you are releasing this arachnoid again very gently because it's thick and non-transparent arachnoid. So now the temporal lobe is mobilizing, you see? You don't want to move the third nerve. When you are mobilizing the, uh, again, you are leaving a small sheet of arachnoid over the third nerve. You're not cutting flush on the third nerve. Can you see that? Can you see that there is a small arachnoid on the third nerve? Can you see that? Yes? Yes. Right, so that means that we are not cutting flush on the third nerve. So you don't want to, Manipulate the third nerve when you move the temporal lobe. So that's what you're doing. So gently we're going all the way back. Cutting the arachnoid. Mobilizing. You see, it's an MC aneurysm. And I'm really not bothered about exposing the MC at, is at this moment. What I'm doing is I'm opening all my windows. Okay. Whatever windows that I can open at the moment, I just relax and open them. There is absolutely no hurry. Okay. And after this, you know that the aneurysm is in the superficial region. You can now mobilize the temporal lobe the way you want it. And so your sylvian opening is going to be rather easy. So approximately you, you are seeing up to the uh, up to the the bifurcation and you're slowly going ahead and opening put a surgery cell where your suction is and put in a small retractor just on the on the frontal lobe just to hold that and then you are going to open up You keep on opening the arachnoid. Make space, open. Make space, open. And it's a ruptured aneurysm. There will be blood. So you wash away the blood. Don't keep extra bleeding. Get a little bit of, get a two millimeter of arachnoid there. And open open it. I'm showing this for the beginners because you guys who, who hasn't started MC aneurysms, this is a good aneurysm to start with, okay? You'll get enchanted with this and then you'll forget about coiling and all that, okay? So, um, you see how beautiful it is? It's a very simple thing, you know? You, I'm just making some space, cutting open. There is no increased speed or uh, I'm not rushing anywhere. Or, so, you see the aneurysm? You see the you see the sylvian dissection keeping on cutting 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 so you open the proximal now you are opening it towards the carotid okay now already you can see that the second layer is opening up the second layer is already that's the second layer it's already opening up you see how beautiful that is okay Nothing was visible to start with, all thick, trans, I mean, non-transparent arachnoid. But once you open layer by layer, you see how, how easy it is getting. Now, this layer, we're opening.
Okay? Yes? Going towards the carotid? So we are opening the entire sylvian there. At this point, I'm not really worried about or I'm not even looking at where the aneurysm is. I'm just keeping on opening the arachnoid, sylvian, everything. Okay, relax. There is a, I'm not worrying about, oh, where is the aneurysm? Is it going to bleed? Okay, am I near the aneurysm? Nothing. Just, you know, this is one art that you have to understand. A lot of people tell me, I'm so worried doing an aneurysm. How can you just, so I just, you know, my point is wander, wander. You know, what is the meaning of wander? Wander, go around, okay? Not aimlessly, okay? Not want, don't wander aimlessly, but wander. Like there is a meaning. I mean, there is no point going into the opposite sylvian cistern and opening it. You are opening the sylvian in the, uh, in the right region. So if you can do that, Wander, not aimlessly, okay? So, keeping on opening. If you focus too much on the aneurysm, then it's going to be a problem, okay? See how I'm opening up every single strand of sylvie. Right. Now we come back again. Now you see that the frontal lobe and temporal lobe is beautifully uh, separated. And you see in an aneurysm like that, if you separate it by force or by blunt dissection, this temporal lobe is going to ooze and then, you know, uh, you, your surgery will be messy. Here, you see, there is no oozing at all. Now we are seeing the MCA very, very clearly, the proximal MCAs. If I want to put a clip or something, I can easily put it. I'm taking off that arachnoid away from the MCA. This arachnoid is usually thin, so I am, then I'm putting in another, another retractor here. I'm using a needle to open This is a very good way to open. High magnification and 24 gauge needle. You have to focus on the tip of the needle and then use it to open. See, the focus on the tip of the needle. Your microscope should be focused on the tip of the needle and then you open. So that is how you go. And then once you open, then you can use your scissors. You know, make the surgery very boring. So many of my fellows and my residents who are in my surgery, they go to sleep. I'm not joking, they go to sleep, you know. Um, I have seen that many times. So the thing is, if that is the thing, that means you are, you are getting better. Because, uh, you know, when you see this repetitive movements without any purpose, generally you go to sleep. Okay? But then by the time they wake up, the aneurysm would be clicked. So that is the thing. You know, you keep on wandering, wandering, wandering. And you keep on opening all the things. And then, you know, you are not looking for the aneurysm. The aneurysm will be looking for you. Okay. The aneurysm might also get bored and say, okay, huh? clip the hell out of me and get out of here. So what are you doing? So something like that. Okay. Instead of that, you make it so messy trying to get into the aneurysm. That's not correct. Okay. That way you don't enjoy it. So you see, 
till now i am not even looking at the aneurysm i am just going on opening everything letting out all the subarachnoid blood okay so now we have opened the silvi in quite a lot lot of vessels there these are all things that you will encounter in your practice okay so please remember you you will encounter all this at this point if you rush not good for you okay so keep on dissecting always dissect parallel and then perpendicular to the vessel you see this is a loop of a vessel on to that mca can you see that and you have to see what is the loop attached to if the loop is attached to only arachnoid it's very easy to take it off but if there is a vessel supposing sometimes there can be a small vessel can you see that small vessel you can take it off there's no problem that'll be less than uh, less than probably 0.5 or 0.2 mm you will see that the very very small vessel so you are first releasing the arachnoid and then you see this vessel so you bipolar this vessel very gently you bipolar this vessel and you cut it and now the entire loop comes backward see that's all arachnoid now you are seeing the aneurysm suddenly you see that is the mca that is the mca under my suction that is one branch of the mca the other branch of the mca is going that side and that's the aneurysm so i'm i don't i am not even uh, dissecting the aneurysm dome because it's ruptured aneurysm and it is ruptured you know it is projecting into the temporal lobe i'm not taking off the temporal lobe i just need to find place to clip so i know there is a branch this way there is a branch that way you will see that branch can you see that branch there can you see that is a branch that way this is the branch this is the branch this way and that's a temporal that's mca stem okay now once i get that this is the aneurysm so i'm mobilizing it so that i find the edge of the other side of the aneurysm where i need to clip i know how much large clip i need and then i see the other side i retract the aneurysm don't this is not a good practice but um, if you are confident that the aneurysm is ruptured and uh, nothing is going to happen then maybe huh, you can retract the aneurysm dome like this not a great habit okay don't follow it right away you can you know retract the aneurysm dome very gently very very gently so that you can get enough space to put your clips in there that is because i don't want to dissect the temporal lobe so i am using a side curved clip to go in and i am first putting in the side curved clip there then i'm going in there one clip once i i i get both the clips in both the legs in and then now i clip it off and you can see the other branch clearly that's the other branch of the mc so very gently and then it's finished okay it's clipped so it's done now you can without any a distraction you can just gently take off all this uh you know 
all these uh, patties and all, extubate the patient and by evening sending to the ward. Okay. Instead of that, if you uh, heave and puff and you know, you try to be fast and all that, you will have a patient who will be in your eyes. <laughs> okay, I'm stopping to share any questions on this. That is a post-op scan, you see? It's beautiful, okay? There is uh, uh, absolutely no issues and this guy is out, okay? Right, okay. Okay, any questions or anything? So, Professor, the, the, the dissection is, is inside out. So you, you, you do the arachnoid release from the cisterns coming towards the cortical surface of the cilium fissure. Did I see it like that or that's a wrong assumption? No, 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 no. It, it, I, never follow, I never follow any pattern. I cut okay. all the arachnoid that is there. That is all. Whether it is from inside out, outside in, I, I change okay, sometimes. Okay. I, I just make sure I cut all the arachnoid. That is all. Okay. So there is, for me, in this section, there is no set pattern at all. You see, if you take off all the arachnoid, whatever remains is the vessel. So take out all the arachnoid. That is your policy. Okay. Don't follow yeah. principles because if you follow these okay. principles, sometimes it'll, they'll come to, you'll come to a dead end and you'll be confused. So the best thing to do would be cut every single strand of arachnoid that there is. Hello, so you. much so that only vessels remain. Uh, okay, excuse me. And there is an order to Hello, follow. Uh, I have a question. You have to, to come from away uh, to the neck or just you have to cut the arachnoid in any order like you have to cut the arachnoid Hello, away from the neck or or just you cut whatever the arachnoid thread you see and that's it like i i would like um, to and not to make a premature rupture of the aneurysm that's what I, what i concern about yeah so a premature rupture in mca is only when you're pushing and pulling on the neck so you don't want to do that so in a in a ruptured aneurysm especially when you are when you are pushing and pulling arachnoid strands attached to the neck that's when you have a rupture so you never push and pull you just do sharp dissection and in this way if you don't push and pull then there's not never going to be a premature rupture and in an mca once you've done your proximal uh, dissection which means if you have your proximal mca under control if you have a premature rupture, this is a way that, uh, this is just a way that the aneurysm uh, is very fast. <laughs> because if that is, if this aneurysm ruptures, you just have to put a temporary clip. You see, I didn't put any temporary clip here. Okay. I never put temporary clips for MC. So, but if there is a rupture, I just put in a temporary clip and uh, I'll dissect uh, rather fast. And instead of uh, all these 20 minutes, you would have a five minute aneurysm. That is all. Okay, it is not a, a premature rupture in an MCA is not a big problem. Okay, I'm sure you will come to that uh, uh, stage. Um, for me, premature rupture in uh, ACOM is the main problem, especially some ACOMs which are pointing posteriorly, superiorly. This is a this is a problem. Otherwise, um, yeah, I'm asking I'm asking for further management and ACOM premature rupture. That's why I'm asking. Um, not about this ah. specific case. I'm asking about if I have a premature rupture in a common aneurysm to, yeah. to avoid the premature rupture. If there is a sequence like I have to dissect on the lateral aspect of A1, A2, this way, that's what I need to know. Uh -huh. Well, I was thinking that you were asking about this, but uh, well, for uh, ACOM, the, the best thing it would be from going from IC to A1. You first dissect the IC, then the sylvian, proximal sylvian completely. If you, have, if you don't, uh, you, you, if you don't dissect the sylvian completely, then you are going to put a lot of pressure to retract the sylvian, I mean, retract the frontal lobe. This is very harmful. So you have to dissect the proximal and mid sylvian completely. 
then you have to dissect the IC completely, lateral IC and medial IC, opticocarotid and lateral carotid. All the arachnoid you have to dissect completely. You have to irrigate a lot and then you come into the A1 region. If the A1 is too much posteriorly going and then, I mean, if the A1 is going too much posteriorly, you don't, you can come near to the aneurysm and get the A1. You don't have to get the A1 completely. You can get come near to the aneurysm and get the A1, but go from the dominant A1, not from the aneurysm to A1. Go from the A1 to the aneurysm, even distal A1 to the aneurysm. And once you have that, you can go across, get the other A1. And once you get it, uh, maybe you may not need a proximal uh, clip or anything. Uh, do you want to see a rupture, echo aneurysm rupture like, like this, what you said? Do you sure. want to see a rupture? Y yes, I, I saw a premature rupture, a common aneurysm before, due to the section, yeah. Okay, I will show you a premature rupture. And uh, uh, since you asked me for this, <coughs> I will show you a rupture. This is something very old, maybe, yeah. Can you see this video? No. Okay. Oh, I am. I have to share, right? Right. Not sharing the screen, bro. Okay. Is it okay now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, it's true. Okay. Can you see this one? Yes. <laughs> yes, I can. Question. So. Uh, this is the aneurysm, inferiorly pointing aneurysm. So I am opening a very, very small dural window. This was pro probably four or five years back. And uh, I'm, I'm opening a 2.5 centimeter incision only. It's a ruptured aneurysm. I have, uh, I'm going to do cystinostomy. Brain is uh, not very lax, so I'm opening the systems first. You can see the optic nerve there. You can see the carotid there. I'm opening all the arachnoid there. So that is the optic nerve. The aneurysm is here. The aneurysm is inferiorly pointing. It is in the, you can see the aneurysm there. Okay, that is the, that is the carotid. And what is happening is this A1 is going very posterior, very posterior. So I don't have to dissect that. I am going into the aneurysm right now. Since you asked me premature rupture, I'm going to yes. show you that I'm going to, I'm going to dissect right over the aneurysm. I'm going to take off the arachnoid of the aneurysm uh, that I will show you now. Uh -huh. So, first I dissect laterally so that if the aneurysm ruptures, I have control of the carotid at least. And after this, after this, this is the, this is the aneurysm. Okay. So, mm -hmm. and I'm going to dissect off this arachnoid, right? I don't even dissect the A1. I am dissecting the aneurysm arachnoid. Now you will see that I am going to dissect the aneurysm arachnoid. I am dissecting over the aneurysm just to expose the aneurysm. I haven't really exposed A1 or anything. I've just exposed the carotid. And see, and that is annual, that is aneurysm. So you don't I have, have any proximal control at this level. No proximal control, nothing. Okay. I am cutting. This is the aneurysm. This is the aneurysm. I am yeah. cutting right at, right above the aneurysm. It may look a bit crazy, but uh, um, well, we have over 500, 600 aneurysms. So we have seen quite a lot of aneurysms rupturing. It doesn't give me a lot of thrill. Of course, it is thrilling to see. I mean, it is exciting to see the aneurysm rupture, but of course, it is not a, 
it's not a big problem now. I don't have a, you know, breakdown. <laughs> so I, this is the aneurysm. I'm dissecting the aneurysm right away. You see, no proximal control. Okay, absolutely no proximal control. This is the aneurysm. And you see what happened? This is the aneurysm, complete aneurysm. But this aneurysm ruptured from the base. It was crazy, but it was ruptured. This is the rupture point. Can you see the black thing? Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yep. It's the rupture point. It doesn't matter to me now because uh, that is a rupture point. It is that is a clot. You can see the clot. I am. Uh, yeah, I can see it. Yep. Yeah. So you can see the aneurysm and the rupture point is okay. No proximal control here. Nothing. This is a. Uh, now you will see when the aneurysm ruptures, what happens. Now I'm trying to make more space between, uh, I know that the A2 is going here like this, okay? So this is the interhemispheric fissure. So I know my clip is, has to go between these two, between the optic nerve and here. That is where my clip has to go, okay? The entire aneurysm is uh, dissected out. And why you didn't make uh, like a complete uh, Sylvian dissection? So it's easier to expose the aneurysm and all the vessels. I know, meaning uh, this is uh, sometimes too much time. So yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I am okay that I am okay with this. That is why I wanted yeah. to show you this picture. Uh, yes. Maybe at this stage, I am okay. I mean, I, I can expose this. Yeah, it's for, it's for a beginner like me, it's, it's very hard. Yeah, it is not good for you to do this. Okay? Yes, I it's know that. It's not good for you to dissect about this aneurysm because if this aneurysm ruptures, if you do not have an idea, this will be. See the rupture now? That is 1438.45. Can you see the time? Yeah, yeah. I see it. It is after. I saw it, yeah. This aneurysm is ruptured now. No proximal control, nothing. Okay, And it is ruptured from the base, not from here. It is ruptured from the base. So no hurry, nothing. Okay. We just put a patty there. Of course, it will not stop the bleeding, huge bleeding. So we put in a temporary clip. That is a temporary clip on the carotid. And I am dissecting the aneurysm. It is 14.40. Two minutes now. Okay. Two minutes over. Five minutes is very safe. Okay. No problem at all. I see clipping of four, five minutes. No problem at all. So five minutes is 300 seconds. Long time. Okay. So I am dissecting the aneurysm furthermore. Now I see this is, this is the aneurysm, this is the aneurysm, and this is the vessel. Okay, I am aggressively, I can see the tear. Can you see the tear? This is the tear. Okay, this is the tear. There is nothing to worry about this tear. This tear is near the base, so I have to keep this tear in my clip and save as much, as, as much of the vessel as possible. Yeah. Okay. So I, that is what I am going to do now. So I dissect, I dissect further. Forgive my, the quality of my video because it is done by, with an old microscope about five years back. Now we have excellent quality. So That's very I, good. We can see. I show, I show everybody the vessel now and now I'm going to be ready for my clip. Yes, yes. Yes, so now I'm going to put in the clip. But when I'm going to put in the clip, the suction stop working and it is bleeding. Okay? I'm not happy with this. So I just keep my clip there. Don't move my clip. Just take and direct suction now. Okay? And I'm putting the clip. I'm moving the clip towards the tear. This is the tear. I'm moving it towards the tear, towards the tear, as much towards the tear. Incorporate the tear within my clip and that's it. Now you can see all the vessels, okay? The A com, A2, opposite A1, this is the clip aneurysm. This is the clip aneurysm, okay? So, not much of a worry, not much of a hurry, okay? Yeah, I get that. No. Huh? Very nice, very nice. Yeah, no jumping, no jumping around, nothing. So, this is... Uh, uh, after you do this, then you will see this patient also now very soon. Okay. <laughs> I have a question so, for you, Dr. Hipe. 
Yes, one second, I finish this and then we will have the questions. See, this guy is, uh, uh, no problem. It doesn't look like intraoperative rupture of uh, uh, echo maneuverism. It's okay. So I stop share now, okay? Yes. Now, yes, your question? Yes. Is there any, in the rupture onism, is there any need for putting the ventricular or the brain catheter? Yes, sometimes yes. Uh, sometimes if there is too much of pressure, yes, maybe we should put in a ventricular catheter to get the pressure down. But uh, usually if there is not much of a pressure, then you can go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, you can go ahead and open the systems like what I did right now. Okay, fine. Thank you so uh, much. And Thank I, was, you for I was telling Goi, Goi, uh, brother, maybe why don't you do your session tomorrow? Meaning both the aneurysm, you present it as a session because uh, uh, tomorrow then I will not be presenting anything. You can present it. Is it okay? Yeah, okay, it's fine. okay. Huh? Okay. Tomorrow okay. I'll, I'll share a uh, uh, Two basilar tip artery and uh, neurorism clipping cases, okay? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Just text me about the uh, info, okay? The title, Dr. Goy? Yeah. Okay. No, you okay. can write, John, you can write two basilar tip aneurysms by Professor Goyi. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Is that okay, Goyi? Yeah, okay. Goyi? Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, yes, so yes, tomorrow's yes, yes. topic will be tomorrow will be yours. So uh, I mean, after if you have any more cases, you can show, and uh, maybe two days later I will join. Again. Great. Okay. Okay. Very good. More comments and questions from the panel. A lot of interaction today, I. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh, well. I am happy. Um, any more questions? If there is, I can take it. Otherwise, I will carry on. Thank you so much. Greetings from Finland. Hello, Joanne. Hi. Um, it was amazing. Absolutely. Always aneurysms. Wow. Made me happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Jo okay. Jo 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 is after seeing a lot of these aneurysms. Otherwise, Sorry? Dr. Hinted, Sorry. Yeah. I hope you forget about coiling and uh, other kinds of, in fact, other kind of uh, ugly things after you see this beautiful clipping. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> definitely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Hinted, congratulations for a very good uh, explanation for the rapid aneurysm. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon? He's, he's Pardon thanking you. Me? He's thanking you, right? Okay, okay, okay. Oh, right. Yeah, Professor, we were discussing some few questions uh, which I thought were related to the topic. <clears throat> sure. And uh, with your input as well. That started before you came. So, this question. I think it is posteriorly. In my experience, when an aneurysm is directed posteriorly, uh, this is like the one I showed you right now. This yeah. is when I yeah. have problems with perforators. Uh, I don't know the answer to this one, though. I think that that's, that's the answer. So, and uh, some anatomy on that. The perforators are rising from the P1. Yeah. And when, when they are pointed... Uh, Posteriorly is, or when there is a uh, artery of Pacheron, in which case yeah. there is only one one side of the supply. Is yeah. one, well, the supply uh, is coming from only one one side of the. Do you PCL. want to see an artery of Pacheron? Do you want to see an artery of Pacheron? Sure. You carry on. Then I will just look for it. I have a video of the artery of Pacheron when we were clipping a basilar tip. Through the supra brow approach, I can show you the artery of Percheron. Let me just see. Just ca you carry on with your presentation. I will just look yeah. one second. 
carry on. So carry on. this, yeah. So this is how it will look like when when the aneurysm is pointed posteriorly and all the perforators are on top or around it. So you'll have a blind spot. You'll have a blind spot as you try to put a clip. And if you're unlucky and put a clip on artery of Pacheron, then definitely the patient will not wake up. Yeah, and as uh, we had discussed earlier, the, the answer is that when the aneurysm is pointed posteriorly, that's when you have the highest risk of uh, clipping a perforator. Ah, yeah. So I, yeah. you want me to, you want me to show an artery of Percheron? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it will be great. How do I, how do I, sh okay, I share. Okay. Yeah, so this is a, this is a supra brow uh, approach for, uh, to the basilar tip. So that is the optic now. This is done in 2012 or something, maybe eight, eight years back. So this is the uh, ICA. I was just showing it in the cystinostomies because uh, they were asking me if it's possible to, you can see now, uh, let me just show you. I am drilling off the posterior clinoid process now. I'm, that is the optic now. I'm drilling off the posterior clinoid. This is the carotid. And this is the drilled off posterior clinoid. This is the drill of posterior clinoid. This is one P1. This is another P1. Can you see that? Yeah. One P1, another P1. And can you see this artery? Yeah. Can you see this single artery? Can you see? One P1, another P1. This is suprabrow approach. So you are seeing the basilar tip right from the front. Okay. This is the PCP yeah. which is drilled off. And, and this aneurysm was not overriding, right? Not high basilar. No, 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 no. It was not. It, in fact, I had to take off this whole PCP and then I had to separate out this and use a very, very long clip for this one. But I wanted to show you this one. So this is P1. This is P1. Can you see the artery of Yes, oh. Yes, I can see. But uh, yes, my yes. question is, we yeah. cannot go for uh, from eyebrow to make a high basilar, right? Uh, yeah, this would be a bit difficult if it is a high riding basilar because uh, then you will have to remove much more of the orbital roof. So uh -huh. I wouldn't recommend that. I would uh, rather recommend... So this uh, one was uh, low or normal basilar position, not over riding. No, it, was it was normal basilar, but I had a large PCP in my way. You see that okay. my PCP not enough. Can you see that? Because the aneurysm is not seen here. Only the P1s are seen here. So I have to cut this membrane of Lilliquest and I have to remove more PCP. And then I am able to clip this aneurysm. Or I have to, after doing this and removing this, I have to shift my microscope angle. Then I'll be able to see the, both the aneurysm and the P1. Okay, so I'm stopping sharing. All right. All right. And any experience with the uh, persistent trigeminal arteries, Professor? Yes. In patients so with we, uh, vascular. Yes, we had once a huge uh, AVM. Uh, okay. And it was uh, the AVM in the frontotemporal region and this was supplied by the persistent trigeminal artery, I remember. <coughs> yes, tell okay, me. So, yeah. so this, the, the question is, um, a patient is being worked up for chronic headache, and then you're shown an angiogram and an MRI, and then uh, uh, you just identify the vessel. Yeah, so if it is around so, the Meckel's cave, if it is around the Meckel's yeah. cave, it is a persistent trigeminal. 
it is about the IAM level. This is the Meckel scale, exactly the Meckel scale, you see? Yeah, yeah. So this is the Meckel scale region. So, and the fifth nerve, fifth nerve region, this is persistent trigeminal. And yeah. IAM region is persistent otic. Okay, so this is this is where the persistent trigeminal artery comes. Mm. So sometimes also these vessels themselves can develop aneurysms. Yes. yes especially at the point where they join the posterior circulation. Yes, these are not easy to uh, operate because you need a lot of skull base approach here. You need skull base okay. approaches here. Yeah. So the, the persistent trigeminal tree supplies the posterior circulation in utero before the development of the vertebral arteries. And they have two types. Uh, type one, sal this gentleman described them, the Salzman types, type one and type two. Professor Ab doesn't like the, num the name, so we'll just call them type one, type two. And in type one, the persistent trigeminal artery supplies the distal vertebral basilar arteries. While in type two, the PTA supplies the superior cerebral arteries. And the, PC, uh, the posterior cerebral arteries are supplied by the PCOM in the type two uh, anomaly. So there are other uh, persistent arteriosclerosis, uh, persistent hypoglossal artery, which arises from the cervical ICA, then persistent protrantal artery, which passes, it, it can vary from, from the cervical to the cavernous to the petrous, and then it passes through the foramen magnum. And then there's the persistent portic artery, which is very rare because it's the first one that regresses and it arises from the petrous ICA. So all these vessels can persist in adulthood and they can also develop pathologies. And the last one is persistent hypoglossal artery, which starts from the cervical ICA and it passes through the hypoglossal canal to, to join the, the posterior circulation. So when we're doing the uh, surgeries for posterior fossa, we need to be aware of any anomaly. Sometimes you may think that the circulation is coming from the normal um, vertebral system. And maybe the patient has an anomaly and the supply is coming from, from a hypoglossal artery. And then if you clip this, if you coagulate or clip this artery or cause a blockage of this artery, then the patient will develop a brainstem impact and will not wake up, wake up from the surgery. Thank you. Uh, if anyone here saw um, a trigeminal neuralgia due to persistent trigeminal artery, it's written, I know. It's a cause of trigeminal neuralgia, but... Uh, Anyone here saw a patient like that? And how to manage it? Like what to do if it's failed medical treatment? Uh, I haven't seen this. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so that is if that is it. Thank you very much for coming today, and uh, we will uh, continue it tomorrow. Tomorrow, Goyi will be doing it, and uh, he will probably talk on two basilar aneurysms. And then, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. At the same time, thank you. Thank you very much for your time and effort. Thank you all. Thank you for that great. Uh,
Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I want to know uh, the next time we, we would meet again. Tomorrow again, 5 p.m. Sorry, what tomorrow, uh, at what time? 5 p.m. Indian Standard Time. John will uh, let you know the current okay. times. The same mm. time, tomorrow, same time. Okay. Every day on the same time. Okay. So see you guys. Uh, see you. All right. See you. Oh, Thank you. Thank you a lot. Bye.